Right, so today we're doing an LS430 2000 to 2005. This one is actually an auto. So you see we've got all the automatic gearbox wiring in there. So let's get into it. Right, so as discussed, this is going to be an LS430 2000 to 2003. That makes it a five-speed auto version. Um, if you want to know how many different types of 3 uz are, I've got a video and I'll put a link up at the top there for you. Right, so this is completely brand new built because you want to bring the ECU inside the vehicle rather than on the outside where it normally sits inside the engine bay. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through the entire layout. Then we're going to carry out a whole bunch of testing, which includes starting the vehicle and everything as well. But first of all, we're going to go through the build process so you guys can see exactly what it looks like underneath all of that heat shrink and what the build process entails. So we'll do that and we'll come back in a second. Right, so that's all good. Now you see what it looks like underneath and what the build process entails for these particular harnesses. So as discussed, first of all, we're going to go through the layout of the harness. And that's so that the customer, Duncan, knows exactly where everything goes and how everything connects together. And then what we'll do is we'll carry out all the testing, which involves obviously starting the engine and some testing with just the ignition on to make sure we're getting the correct signals where we are supposed to. Right, so in terms of the layout... Starting from the ECU itself, we've got one, two, three plugs there, which go to the engine harness. You've then got the one section which breaks off there and it goes to the fuse box over there. So that is basically your engine harness completely in its entirety. Then we move over to the body plugs or what I refer to as body plugs. It's the 31 and 35 pin plug on the ECU there. That comes off and it goes to its plug in the fuse box over there. And then we have a break off for the accelerator pedal. And there's a two meter long harness that runs all the way around there. And in this case, going up to the pedal that the customer provided which is an IS220 IS250 pedal all right once you go from there oh sorry we there is two plugs that are customer connection plugs but I'm going to go through that as part of a whole section explaining exactly what everything does and we'll do that as soon as I finish on the layout so coming from the ECU along here you'll see we have a grommet that's meant to go into the firewall you'll notice that we do have a glue lined heat shrink that's not shrunk down so basically what we do is we leave it like this so that you as a customer can then move the grommet to where it's going to be most suitable in your particular application and then grab a heat gun and glue that down and it's a glue lined heat shrink so it'll keep everything nice and sealed all right coming up from there we then come to our molded t-piece at the back here so this is a raken molded t-piece boot to separate everything going that way and that way first we're going to come down this way and then we're going to go that way over there so starting from here We've got the first breakout, which is coil seven or IGN seven. Hopefully you can see that on there. Again, everything is labeled, so you should be able to get it on no problem at all. But then it comes down here, goes along there, then it breaks out to go to your cam sensor on your left bank. That's for, for the BBTI system. Then you've got coil five and coil three. Again, all labeled up for you over there. Then coming forward along here, it's gonna break out at, towards the front and it's gonna to go to your oil control valve for the left bank or OCL as it's labeled here. Then we've got ignition one, basically coil one on this side. It does break off to go to the cam sensor and so you can actually join these two wires further down here and you can cable tie them on that little mount that's holding it on there. Coming down the front here, you've then got the two holes there and there and that's the two other holes to actually mount the harness and clip it in place like that. All right, so make sure you've got those in place there. Once we get down to here, it's going to break out into three sections. So two of the sections in this case are going to make their way through the hole down there, through down there, and then over to here. And there you've got your crank sensor over there, and you've got your oil pressure switch over there. 
The third one coming down here, and the plug does actually go through there. I just don't have it done at the moment. But basically, goes. it'll come out there, come around the back there, and then it goes to your lambda sensor at the back here. Now, usually, on the standard harness, it comes through there. But obviously, that's incredibly close to the exhaust. It requires you guys to keep a heat shield in place, which some of you guys don't. And so this now then keeps it completely away from the exhaust and away from the heat source and protects the connector and everything to make it last a lot longer. Okay, so that's this side done. What I'm going to do now is go back to the T-piece and we're going to start on what breaks out over here. So, we've got two earth points, so both labeled ground and they both go onto the M6 nut over a bolt over there that's at the back of your engine. Also coming out here we have the sub connector and that's the one that goes to your starter and your knock underneath. Okay, and this obviously is installed with the inlet manifold off. Okay, and in this case, we have actually provisioned for if the customer ever wanted to go to an aftermarket ECU, we do have the twin core shielded cable in here, so he can swap out the sub harness and he can have Bosch wideband knock sensors if he wants to go with an aftermarket ECU. All right, next up, then we've got the injector and ACIS sub harness. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is I do have a video on how to install this, so I'm going to put a link up at the top there for that so you can watch that. That's also required to be installed when the inlet manifold is off, so these two are going to be installed when you take the inlet manifold off to carry out that installation all right so again and the video will show you exactly what it looks like underneath but basically that comes in over here breaks out and comes out to go to all your injectors and again same on this side over here so it's coming out here to go to all of your injectors and also the um, vacuum solenoid valve that controls the ACIS system that is underneath there as well so that's a very good time to test that valve you can just supply it with 12 volts. It is polarity sensitive, so one way it'll work, one way it won't work. And so just test it and make sure you do get a click. If you don't, rather replace it now before you put everything back together. Save you a lot of time and hassle having to pull the whole inlet manifold out. All right. Okay, so that's that. And then in our case, we've also got all the gearbox stuff coming out of here because it is an auto. So you'll see there we've got our NCA or input speed sensor on the front of the gearbox. We've then got our selector, which again is going to be bolted to the gearbox. We've then got our solenoid plug which is bolted all at the back there. And then we've got our SP2, which is our output speed sensor, which again is the plug right near the solenoid plug at the back of the gearbox. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna screw around the other side because we've got the rest of the harness going on there. Right, so as it comes along here, you're gonna have another breakout over here, which you can use that little bolt hole there to put a P-clamp and hold it in place over there. But coming out this side, we've got a ground. So that's again going to the M6 bolt that goes over there. And then coming out this side, we've got coil number eight. So do remember, if I haven't mentioned it, this is the left bank. So you're always looking from the back of the engine. So this is one, three, five, and seven. And this is the right bank. And it's obviously two, four, six, and eight. Okay, so you always, if I refer to left or right bank, it's always from looking from the back of the engine or from the driver's position. In other words, facing forward. All right. So the harness will then come along through there. It's then going to break out again down here and it's going to go to the cam sensor over there and it's going to go to coil six and coil four over there all right then it's going to come and it's going to break out at the front over here which is then going to end up going to your coolant temp sensor over there now what you'll notice is we have a wire called temp that isn't terminated now i've got a 1uz non-vvti temp sensor in here this is just for our testing purposes but on a 3UZ, you'll find um, that this has a bolt in it, which can be removed, and you can fit a temp sensor of your choice inside there. Okay, so this is basically here just to help you guys out when you want to fit a temp gauge in. You can put a sensor that's going to work with your temp gauge, whether it be a standard cluster, whether it be an aftermarket one that you buy. You can then terminate this wire to your choice, and then put it onto that sensor over there, and then you'll, it'll come through by the ECU, by the fuse box over there, and we'll go through those wires in a minute. All right. Then next up, we have got the throttle plug. So again, this is on a sub harness. So if you need to change the throttle and you can't get your hands on a five-speed one, you can only get a six-speed one. You can phone us up, we'll make you a six-speed throttle body sub harness. Or if you go aftermarket and you want to put a Bosch throttle body on, we can then make your sub harness for one of those from that one. So it makes the options open there. Then we're going to break out to the oil control valve for the right bank, or OCR, as it's called here. And then also from here, we are going to break out and it is going to go to the mass airflow sensor. So do make sure you have the correct mass airflow sensor for your vehicle. Um, this is obviously the LS431. 
Uh, you sometimes you'll find the GS and the SC have a like a 45 degree turned up angle. So if you go back and look at the last GS one I did, you'll see the turned up angle. And I think the GS and the SC have that particular math. So it's important that you get the correct one for your ECU. Right, and coming down here, you'll see the harness goes down, 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 and it's gonna break out here by the alternator, and it's then gonna to go to the alternator sub harness. So again, same reasoning, you can get the later generation GS and LS430 um, six speed alternators, which come with a four pin plug. So we do have these, so if you do ever need to replace the alternator and you cannot get your hands on the three pin one, buy the four pin one, give us a call and we can make you a sub harness to work with the four pin one, no problem at all. And then lastly, it's coming down to the lambda sensor plug over here. So just remember, we are only using the two main lambda sensors that go in the exhaust manifold. The secondary lambda sensors are completely mapped out of the ECU. So you'll see we have no error codes for the secondary lambda sensors on there. Right, so that is the complete layout of the harness. Oh, and just lastly, you'll see here, there's your plug for your throttle, your two-pin plug over there, and then you've got your four-pin plug for the TPS, and that can go underneath the back over there. All right, that also means as well that although you do have some water connections on your throttle, which is obviously these pipes down here, um, if you disconnect those and you wanted to remove the entire intake with the throttle, it now means you've just got to remove the six pin plug for the throttle, the 12 pin plug for injector and ACIS, and you can lift up the whole inlet manifold without having to remove any of these connectors at all from everything that you're pulling out. All right. But if you want to remove that and then remove that secondary, again, same scenario, you just unplug it there so you can remove the whole inlet manifold without having to remove the injectors. Uh, the reason being is that these standard Toyota plugs are actually only designed for a very small number of cycles. By cycles, I mean plugging and unplugging. So effectively, the less time you have to unplug and plug it back in again, the longer they're going to last. And these DTM plugs, they have a much higher cycle life of being able to disconnect and connect than the standard one. So that's why we do that as well. So it saves you having to disconnect all the injector plugs every time you want to take the inlet manifold off, which sometimes in a swap, can be quite a few times you'll be surprised at how many that they are all right right so now we've done the layout of the actual harness what we're going to do is move over to the two plugs that the customer is going to connect on their side we're going to go through each of the wires and what they do how they are connected obviously duncan you're going to get this whole pack with the harness so i'll email it to you so you do have that at all times we do keep a copy um, for eternity basically uh, and that does remind me while you guys are watching if you do ever sell your harness or if you've bought a harness from somebody from us Please make sure you get in touch, give us the person's name who you bought it from and your name and we can move all of this paperwork over to your name. If you're the third, fourth person who bought a harness and you can't tell me who you got it from, then we can't pull up your paperwork. So just bear that in mind guys, if you are watching, if you do buy a harness from someone secondhand, get in touch with us so we can move that paperwork over to your name. So if you ever need diagnostic help in the future, we know exactly what has gone on with the harness there. Right, now that that's out of the way, so we have two plugs, we have a 9-pin plug and we have a 12-pin plug over there. The 9-pin plug, that is your main one and that's going to have a lot of stuff that's going to get the engine running. The 12-pin plug over here, that's a lot to do with the gearbox and OBD2 as you'll see in a minute when we go through it. Right, so starting from this one over here, number one, pin number one is a red 14-gauge wire. That is permanent 12-volt supply. Now, the reason it's permanent 12-volt supply is because the ECU stores diagnostic codes when they occur. So if you connect that to an ignition 12-volt source, what's going to happen is every time you turn the key off, the ECU is going to reset, and therefore it's going to make diagnostics incredibly difficult. So please don't connect that to an ignition source. Do connect it to a permanent 12-volt supply. All right. Next up is pin number two. That's black and yellow. That's your start signal. So that requires a 12 volts. So effectively, that'll be a 12 volts from either the back of your key barrel, if you're using a key barrel to work it out, or if you're using a start button, just supply the one side with 12 volts and the other side to the black and yellow wire. Now, do remember the black and yellow wire, you see it's only a 20 gauge wire here. This is obviously not going to the starter motor itself. It's done through a relay inside the fuse box. So you don't need to supply a lot of current uh, through that particular wire. So if you've got a little switch that you want to do for a starter button, it's not a problem. You're going to put almost no current through it whatsoever. Number three is yellow green. So that's going to be gauge temp. So remember how I spoke about the wire close to the coolant temp sensor for the ECU, the two wire one? That's going to come out here and that's going to be your yellow green wire. So in this case, you can actually see we've got it hooked up to our little device here. Now remember, this device has got nothing to do with this harness because I know somebody asked about that. This is purely for my testing so I can convert the signal so I can use my cluster that I have here to make sure it's working. So you can actually see I've got a coolant temp gauge reading on there. All right. So that's the yellow and green one, so I know that works 100%. Next up, number four, that's a gray 16 gauge wire, and that's gonna be your fuel pump. So you can see I've got the red and the gray one out here, because I'm obviously having to 
feed my pump and everything from this fuse box to make sure that everything is working exactly as it should. All right, so fuel pumps, just remember Toyota works them in very weird ways depending on your particular model. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a link up at the top here on the Toyota fuel system so you can see exactly how they do work, all right? Next up, we've got yellow red. That's your check engine light. So in this case, you'll see my yellow red is going to my cluster over there. We also have the LED inside the fuse box. That is a check engine light. So we do that just in case you guys don't, have, don't wire all of this stuff up and you still wanna know if everything is working. That's why we put that in the fuse box there for you. Number six is yellow, and that's gonna be your taco feed. So remember the taco feed or rev counter feed is coming from the ECU. Do bear in mind it is a four cylinder feed and it's what they call like a negative pulse. So if you're using like an aftermarket gauge, just make sure that it's not looking for a positive signal from a coil because this signal won't work with that. You need to have one that works on a negative signal from a coil, all right? If you're using this with a cluster that did use an igniter to get its signal, just remember that usually on those clusters there's a resistor in the back of the cluster and that then brings the signal down from what outputs from an igniter for the rev counter to use. So sometimes if you try and connect the rev counter signal and it doesn't work, it may sometimes be that the actual rev counter in question used an igniter in the past and therefore it's got a resistor in. So all you need to do is find the tech input follow it along and more than likely you will find a resistor, remove that resistor, put a wire in its place to join the circuit back together and then yeah, that rev counter will happily accept the low level signal from an ECU to make it work. So I know this, a lot, of, a lot of the old Toyotas that used to use igniters, they have that problem where they were accepting a high level signal but instead of making the device actually accept it, they were just putting a resistor to bring the high level to a low level signal down. All right, so that's a bit of information for you there. Uh, number seven is black with a red tracer and that's your ignition feed. Now then, when I say ignition feed, obviously that's your ignition 12 volts. If you're using a key barrel, please be careful because you do have accessory feed and you have ignition feed. So always make sure that when you find the 12 volts, when you turn the ignition on, that that stays on when it moves to the start position. An accessory feed will cut 12 volts when the key moves to the start position and an ignition feed will remain having 12 volts if the key is in the start position. Okay. If you connect this black with a red wire to the accessory feed, what's basically going to happen is every time you go to crank it, you're effectively going to turn off the ECU so it'll never start. All right, so just bear that in mind and make sure you do that. Um, it happens more than you think that people do connect it up in a rush or whatever and they don't check and then they end up with that problem. And everything seems fine because you go put the key on, the, the check engine light comes on, everything is happy. Then when you go to turn the key, remember sometimes on standard vehicles, the cluster on the lights or whatever do get cut out when you go to crank it not all of them but some of them might do and they would cause the check engine light to go out anyway so you'd think there's absolutely nothing wrong without realizing that you're actually cutting the power to the ecu every time you turn it cranking so please bear in mind do double and triple check that, that you have got that correct uh, number eight is pink blue and that's going to be your charge light so again super simple that is literally just the alternator charge light and that's going to come on when you turn the ignition on it's a ground signal from the um, alternator itself so the other side of your led should be 12 volts now do remember if you do have a old dash with an incandescent bulb instead of an led bulb make sure that you either fit a diode in or actually a better solution is going to be to change the incandescent bulb for an led bulb because that then is going to mean that we don't get any back feed from the cluster it back into the system so i've had that in the past where the clusters back feed into the system because these were always designed to go into a system. These were actually designed to go into the ECU. So there was no possibility of a feedback whatsoever. But in this case, we obviously bring it out to here so you guys can connect it to an LED. So again, incandescent bulb, make sure you put a diode in. Otherwise, change the incandescent bulb for LED, job's done. It puts a diode in the system for you automatically. Right, number nine, yellow black, that's oil pressure. Again, super simple. That is literally just connected to the oil pressure switch on the engine and it's gonna come on when we've got oil pressure, all right? Okay, so that's the nine pin plug over there. So now what we're gonna do is move over to the 12 pin plug and that's gonna be basically gearbox related uh, apart from the OBD2. So I'm just gonna move over to the 12 pin plug over there. Right, so first of all, we've got our OBD2 connector, which basically takes a position one, four, seven, and 10. All right, so that's the top row here of the plug, but you'll see the OBD2 plug over here. It's all wired up and everything ready to go. Now then number two is white and blue, so that is your brake switch. So that is effectively, the Toyota had a, a four wire brake switch, so it knew when the brakes were pressed and when they were not pressed, 
We've taken care of all of that inside the fuse box for you. So all you need to do is to supply the white blue wire on the 12 pin plug with 12 volts whenever the brakes are pressed and the system will take care of everything for you. So that's all you need to do. So you can use the um, feed from your brake light switch um, if that's a 12 volt feed. If not, use this supply that basically supplies your brake lights with their 12 volts. It is all fused inside the, EC, inside the fuse box there. So no, no damage can come to the ECU in that regard, all right? Then number three is orange and that's two. Now that basically means that wire is gonna supply 12 volts when the gearbox is in two. So in other words, you've got park, reverse, neutral, drive, three and two. So remember these five speed models, um, four and L are actually electronic signal. So if you look at the original shifters, they went park, reverse, neutral, drive, then they went sideways to four, then it went down to three, down to two, and then back sideways to L. So four and L are electronic signals, so your mechanical movements on the gearbox are park, reverse, neutral, drive, three, and two, okay? So what we've basically done is, in order for you to use L and four, we're now supplying orange, which is your two, so that'll supply 12 volts when the gearbox is in two. Now that's the wire that you're gonna use in conjunction with the pin number nine, which is the red one, which is L. So that's the wire that you're gonna use either, if you're using a standard LS430 shifter, you're gonna use that to supply the shifter with the two source, and then you're gonna take the red one to the L source. L meaning low. If you are not using an original shifter and you wanna just have like two switches next to the shifter for L and four, then basically what we do is you supply it with the two, that can then go through a switch to L, Okay, so that means that the gearbox and the ECU will only receive a low signal when the gear selector is in two. The reason we do that is so that you don't get signals at the incorrect time, and it's the way to do it. So effectively, if you're in two, you press your little button to go into L, that's all fine. If you move from two to three, what happens is the two that's supplying L suddenly cuts power. That means the ECU will never have L and three, or L and drive having 12 volts at the same time, which it doesn't like, okay? So, orange is two, low is red, which is pin number nine, drive is yellow, pin number six, and four is blue red, which is pin number 12. So again, we're using the D or drive wire, the yellow wire, to supply 12 volts to the blue red wire, which is four. We're using the orange wire, which is two, to supply the red wire, which is L, with 12 volts when you want it in low. Okay, so those are those four wires over there explained. Next up is number five, which is your red with a yellow tracer, and that is your CCS or cruise control switch. Now, because this is an auto, it's got all the speed signals to the ECU, so we can maintain cruise control. Um, it's a very, very simple system. You just need to get a cruise control switch from a similar sort of year vehicle. So anything from like 98 to 2005 or even 2010, because the SCs ran to 2010. So it's that very simple to add a cruise control switch. One side goes to earth, the other side goes to, in our case, the red with the yellow wire. Voila, you've got cruise control. Just follow the um, indications on the switch and that will work exactly as you expect it to, all right? Uh, number eight now is black with a red tracer and that is reverse. Again, really simple. It's just supplying 12 volts when the gearbox is in reverse and that you can use then to power your reverse lights, all right? And then last but not least, number 11 is the white wire and that is the kick down switch. Now then, play close attention. This is only relevant for European LS430s, okay? And SC430s and GS430s. US domestic market and Japanese domestic market, LS430s and, and GS430s and SC430s, they did not have a kick down switch, okay? So this is only relevant for European models. So just be aware, if you've got a US one, you don't have a kick down switch. If you've got a JDM one, you don't have a kick down switch. Only European, all right? So. How does it work? Effectively, you just put a switch behind the pedal. One side of the switch goes to ground and the other side of the switch goes to our kick down switch over there, okay? Don't ask me why they only did it on European models. I have no clue, but basically that's the way it is. Only European models have kick down switches. Everybody else doesn't, all right? So that is the complete 12 pin plug over there. So that's everything that you need to connect. Again, Duncan, you will have this entire sheet with you, so don't stress about remembering everything. It's just I like to go through everything because sometimes it's easier to explain than trying to write out a 20-page essay on how you explain everything, okay, how you connect everything. Right, so now that that's done, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go and start it up, we're gonna test everything, uh, make sure everything works, and then we're gonna move on to our actual physical testing of the harness itself. All right, so let me get that done, and I'll get back to you guys in a second. Bye-bye. 
Right, so as we've gone through the layout, you know exactly where everything is plugged in, or well, the customer specifically. We're gonna move now into the testing. Now the testing is made up of two parts. First, we basically just put the ignition on, a couple of signals we're gonna test, a couple of indication lights like oil light, etc. And then we're gonna start the engine up and then we're gonna test a whole bunch of stuff that is with the engine running to make sure that works as it should do. So I'm gonna go through what we're gonna test on the sheet over here. And then what we'll do is we'll just get in and test it. So for the just the ignition on part, which is this top section over here, that's gonna be check engine light, oil light, alternate light, and coolant temp. So basically we're gonna make sure all the lights come up on the dash. We also have a check engine light on the fuse box over there. OBD2, we're gonna make sure this machine, which is plugged into the OBD2 plug attached to the fuse box, communicates exactly as we expect it to. Then we're gonna come down and we're gonna start doing things like the gear selector. So we're testing park, reverse, neutral, drive, three and two. That's the mechanical movement on the actual selector switch, which is just over there. And we'll see all of that data on the OBD2 machine over here. Shifter wiring, we're just gonna make sure that the actual park neutral switch works. So in other words, we're gonna put it in park, try and start it, see the engine crank over, move it over to reverse, try and start it, see that nothing happens. So that's making sure that the park neutral switch on that is actually working as expected. Then we've got brake switch. So nice and simple, we're just gonna provide our white with a blue tracer with 12 volts, and that is then going to show us on the machine that the brake switch is turning on and off. You'll also hear the relay click that's taking care of that whole system. Fuel pump, so we're gonna use the machine to test the fuel pump. So in this case, the fuel pump is being controlled by the ECU. Um, I'm gonna put a link up at the top there. That is a video I did explaining how the fuel pump systems work depending on models. Uh, so again, this one is a simple relay system via the ECU. So we can use the machine to turn the fuel pump on and off. And just remember the basics, number one, it doesn't prime. Number two, it, the fuel pump will come on when it receives the starter signal, aka when the engine is cranking. Number three, it'll keep running as long as the crank angle sensor picks up a signal from the rotation of the engine. In other words, if the engine is running, it'll keep running the fuel pump. If the engine stops running, it'll stop running the fuel pump. Do bear in mind the way the Toyota wire up and the way that we wire up, the fuel pump will carry on running for a few seconds after you turn off the ignition. That is completely normal. What most people are expecting though is it's a prime and it doesn't. And the reason is it's a deadhead system. In other words, it doesn't have a return on the engine, unlike the one you said non-VVTI. These are fuel pulsation dampers. And as you can see, overnight, I've just started this engine up, um, well, a bit, of, a bit ago now, but I've still got some pressure on the fuel rail here. So the idea is that your whatever system you're using, um, if, these, if these screws go straight down as soon as you turn the key off, all it basically means is when you come to crank it, it's gonna take a little bit of extra time to start. If you had a system like these ones, for instance, this is just a, a, a VW Golf or a Polo, um, fuel filter that's got a built-in regulator to four bar. You can see it says they're four bar. You get them in three bar, four bar. Anyway, this uh, actually maintains fuel pressure. So usually overnight, in this case, probably not overnight because it's already gone down. But some systems, if you have a non-return valve in the system, it'll keep the fuel pressure overnight. And when you come to start it in the morning, you'll already have fuel pressure there and she'll crank over nice and easy. Okay, so that's just something about the fuel systems that a lot of people get confused about. Uh, next up is obviously engine starting. So we're gonna test the starter. That's nice and simple. She cranks over and starts, we know that works. ACIS, so that's this little valve at the back here. This should close once the engine starts up. So you can see it's in an upright position at rest, closes down. I'm gonna put a video link up in the top there. I did a video explaining exactly what the ACIS system is, how it works, what it does. So that should give you loads of information there. Drive-by-wire, again, super simple. It's a drive-by-wire system, so as soon as I touch that pedal, boom, she should rev up, and I know everything is working as it should do. VVTi solenoids. So that is the VVTi solenoids over there, or oil control valve, as they're also called. Now, there's one on each bank, and what my system will do is it will test them by retarding the cams. And so what you'll hear is the engine go all lumpy when I do it, and I have to do each bank separately. So we should get a really nice note, uh, change in engine note as soon as I do that. And you'll be able to hear it on the uh, video. TAC, uh, that's super simple. We're just gonna go over to the tachometer over here or rev counter and we're gonna make sure that signal is coming through. Do bear in mind, and i just like to mention this to most people, if you have a cluster that used to get its signal from an igniter, so this is mainly to do with Toyota, if, you, if it used to get its signal from the igniter, usually in the cluster there's a resistor to turn the high level signal from an igniter down to a low level signal. In this case, it's coming from the ECU, so it's already a low-level signal. So if you've got an old Toyota cluster that you want to use to get a rev counter signal from this ECU, it's absolutely fine. Number one, make sure it's from a four-cylinder, so like a Camry Corolla, something like that. 
Number two, make sure that if it's an old one that used to have an igniter, that you follow the tech signal from where it wires into the actual um, tech itself, okay? And make sure that there's not a resistor there. If there is, remove it, but then join the two holes where the resistor was soldered to with a piece of wire to allow the signal to come directly through. For instance, these ones, like the IS200, they're way past that. This is a full PCB board with LEDs and everything on, so that is way past that. But if you had like an old Land Cruiser or something like that, they usually end up in that particular scenario. Um, when it comes to diesel, it becomes a lot more complicated. They used to take signals off the alternators, etc. So that's a whole other ball together. But for a nice, simple fix, if you guys want a cluster, um, old Toyota one, pull the resistor out, boom, um, and then you can take the low level signal from that and then feed that cluster and that'll work absolutely fine. Um, in this case, I'm just feeding the signal via this device which converts it from four cylinder to six cylinder so we get a correct signal there. All right, so that's tech. Right, injectors and coils. All I've basically done is I haven't clipped any of these injectors in, so it's easier for me to get them undone with while I'm holding the camera. So. I do apologize if it starts to run any misfire, you'll see me just start pushing down on the injectors. It's just because they're actually resting on here. They're actually not clipped in at all. So I push them down as hard as I can without clipping them in. Because uh, I've got new terminals, they have a lot of um, uh, clamping force on the terminals. So they do usually give me no problems over there. So that's another little uh, hint for you guys. Um, if your terminals are getting very old, all of these terminals basically rely on like a clamping force. And every time you unplug and plug and plug and plug, that clamping force becomes less and less and less. So what you can tend to find is like this, I can just rest the terminal on and it'll run absolutely fine. Again, on a stand, not on a driving car. But sometimes with the older harnesses, like the 1UZs and the 3UZs that we don't build brand new and we don't put new terminals on, you'll actually find that I'm not even able to rest them on here and do that operation. So. If the keynote amongst you would have noticed that sometimes when we do an adapted harness, I actually have to have these all clipped in. Whereas on the new harnesses, I can just leave them resting on there. So little tip, if you're having, if you want to test and see whether your terminals are quite old and possibly need replacing, it's a good little test to do while you're idling. Just don't pull off your connectors, just rent, rest them on gently. And if you cannot get it to idle nicely without having to actually come in and push and clip them all down, hey, maybe it's worthwhile changing the terminals. Uh, might solve some other problems as well that you've got there. Okay, uh, so that's that. And then we'll go into the diagnostics, how to do it, what information you can get, what you can't get, etc. Okay, so let's get started now by putting the ignition on. So again, black with a right red tracer wire. That's your ignition feed. We're going to plug that in over there to my 12 volts. Now you can see I've got the check engine light on there. That's lit up. I've got the check engine light on there. We've got the oil light on there. We do have somewhat of a coolant temp. It's just off the needle there, but once we start the engine, we'll come back to it and we'll take a look at that. I've got my alternator light on there, which is that LED over there. So I've got check engine, oil, alternator, and coolant temp. That's all fine. Right, let's come over to the OBD2 machine. Now these do take a while to actually load up. So I've done that before getting on the video, so you don't have to wait half an hour. But you can see here, it is LS430 that it's picking up and it's plugged directly into the harness over there. So let's go back to engine and electronically controlled transmission. We'll go back into the data list once that loads up. Now what I'm going to do is we're going to go through the gear selector and the brake switch, etc. So I'm just going to create my own custom list of data. These, uh, this machine in particular, and the way it communicates via K-Line is a very slow form of communication. So you can reduce the lag by reducing the amount of data that you are trying to pull through. So I'm just going to pull through what we need for now. So we've got that. That's how it's in park or neutral. All right, then we've got reverse. We've got drive, four, three, two, low. And then obviously after we've done the gearbox, we want to test the um, stop switch. Where's the stop switch? Stop switch, stop switch. Probably gone past it now, haven't I? Stop switch, stop switch. Stop light switch, boom. And what I'll do is I'll actually do the starter as well. Right, hang on. Let's go and find the starter, because then I can do that as part of the park neutral park switch wiring. Starter signal, there you go. Right, so now we've reduced the data, so we're gonna get a lot faster refresh rate on that. Okay, so. 
Here's my selector plugged into the harness. As you can see, we are now in park. Now, I'm just gonna quickly take a brief moment to put a link up in the top here. I have done a video on park neutral park switches and how they work with Toyotas, all right? Um, and they may be different on other vehicles, but every Toyota or Lexus that I've come across, they work in this particular way. So, to sum it down, you can watch the video for a much more in-depth explanation, but to sum it down, you've got two wires that are big there, uh, in the big terminals over there. That's your park neutral switch that controls the relay. That's what then stops your vehicle from starting in the event that you're not in park or neutral, right? completely separate got nothing to do with ecu that goes straight from there to the relay itself right cool then you've got all these smaller wires here which basically is 12 volts park reverse neutral drive three and two okay so those are your wires over there now those are purely signals to the ecu okay so in other words if i remove these two wires these big wires over here the vehicle would not start under any circumstance right but it would still indicate that it's in park and neutral on the ECU because two completely separate circuits that have nothing to do with each other other than the fact that they are connected to the same device. All right, so again, watch the video for a more in-depth review, but that's the basic of it. So at the moment we're in park, indicated by park neutral park switch. I'm gonna move it now to reverse. You probably hear it clicking as I go around there. So that's now reverse. Gonna go into neutral again, so you see park neutral park switch is on. I'm hoping you're getting all of this, by the way. I'm trying to see if I can, quality's rubbish. Right, so that's now drive is on. Three is on. Two is on, and that's that. Right, so that's all your mechanical movements. That's all you have mechanically. Now we're gonna do the four and the L. So, because we're already on two, let's do L. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our diagram over here of the plugs. We know that orange is two, so that's got 12 volts now because we can see that the second signal is on. We also know that red is L, so now we're gonna use two to power L. So that's gonna be red and orange. Okay, so just, I'm gonna twist these together quickly. Okay. Right, so now if I come over here, you'll now see that we've got two second and low are now on. Now then, this is gonna show in detail why we do this exactly the way we do. It's how to go to do it, and it's a very nice and simple system. Right, so if I now move from two up to three, there you go. Now you see three is active, but two and low have gone off. Okay, so that's pretty important. So now the ECU is happy because it knows that it couldn't possibly have low and three on at the same time. Now then, sometimes, People would just connect four via a switch, uh, and on the other side of the switch, just put an ignition 12 volts. That's fantastic. Yes, it will do the job. But the problem is, if you're in drive, and you flick the switch to put on four, now the reason you might do that is, let's say you're towing a caravan because you're in a four by four, and you're going up a hill. So you go from drive, you go to four. Okay, cool. Now it's going, that's, it'll gear down to fourth gear. Now the, it gets a little bit steeper. Now you're going up a hill, you're not concentrating super loads. You forget to flick the four button off before you move it down to three. Now all of a sudden the issue's got four and three at the same time. It doesn't like that. It's not happy about the situation. It starts doing funny things. As you can imagine, what you're doing is telling it something that it thinks is physically impossible, okay? So by using the D to power the four, even if you were to forget to put that switch off and you went down to three, it's gonna be fine. The ECU is happy, it's getting signals exactly as it is meant to get. Okay, so that is the reason why we do that. So please guys, do connect it that way. It just makes life a whole lot easier. If you do have the original shifter, you will actually see that that is how it is wired. And if you have the original shifter, I can send you all the details on how to wire these particular wires to your shifter, okay. Right, okay, so that's that. So now we'll go from third, we're gonna go up to drive. So let's go to drive. Okay, so drive is there, four is down below that one. Right, so we know that drive is yellow. We know that four is blue and red. So I've got my yellow and my blue and my red. So I'm just gonna twist those two together. Okay. And now you'll see the drive and four are both on. And I'm going to move it over to neutral and you see they both go off. All right, go back to drive, they both go on. Go back to three, go back to two, and they both go on. Now, one other section that I wanna cover and I'm gonna show you that I don't, let me just see if I can do this quickly if I get to the edge. 
Right, at the moment, you'll see there's nothing indicated on there, and I haven't moved that switch. If I just gently, and I mean ever so gently, let me see if I can get the lights on here, you can see, I'm just gonna move it like a millimeter, and there, you see now three is on, Super important, this is an elongated hole. The reason it's elongated is you can adjust this on the gearbox to the side. Now, I find this a lot with swaps. Um, it's, it's nothing that anybody's done. It's just basically because you made your new system to make it all work. And because it's an elongated hole, it, it demonstrates that even on standard vehicles, it can cause a problem. Number one, when you've done a swap, and you're going through the gears and you want to make sure that it's all okay. Everybody just goes through the gears and they think, ah, it, it clunks, it goes into gear and it moves, everything is hunky-dory, right? But what I advise you and I, I ask you to check as well is to make sure that you use the wires that I've given you. So you can do it on two, you can do it on drive, you can do it on reverse, whichever one you want to do it on. Put a multimeter on, make sure that D has got 12 volts when you put it into drive, okay? What you also want to do is you want to boot it. Okay, the reason I say boot it is because you're then going to put a lot of torsional strain on the, on the engine mounts. The motor is going to twist a little bit and you can literally be on the precipice of being on that indicator. And all it takes is just, just booting that engine to move it just that fraction a little bit and then it goes off and the ECU then is no longer receiving any signals. And then it plays up and does all types of funny things. So, once you've got your gear stick on and you're happy that the mechanical movements are working and it is clicking exactly as you expected to, do stop and do the electronic check. Make sure that the ECU is getting the signals correctly as well because this is adjustable and there's a reason it's adjustable is because it can be out of sync and you can lose that. So please make sure, especially auto models, that you do do that. And any guys with standard vehicles, if you're having really weird issues, if you like boot it, just check. It's a simple, nice, easy check. And again, you can elongate it hold, you can just loosen that bolt and you can adjust these. There's no drama there at all. Right, okay, so that's the gear selector done. So we've gone through all the actual gear positions. So now let's do the shifter wiring. So what am I looking for? I'm basically looking for it to start only in park or neutral. So this is a very good time. At the moment, she is on third. So technically she should not start. So I've got my black with a yellow tracer wire there. And if I touch on the 12 volts, I get absolutely nothing. I'm now gonna move it over to, let's go back to neutral. Okay, hang on, let's go there, so in neutral, we're in reverse, okay, that's back to neutral, right, okay, so now let's go and there you go, so you can see I even get a starter signal on there, see that, right, let's go back to park, okay, so just to show you that was reverse, that's now park, and exactly the same thing, I'm just going to touch it there, and you'll see we get a little start signal as soon as we do that. Okay, obviously I don't want to start the engine yet. We're not there yet, but that's fine. You probably also in the background heard the relay click there. That was for the fuel pump. So as you can see now, we've got absolutely full pressure on the system there because again, the fuel pump works when you get the starter signal. Okay, so that is now all done. So let's move over to the brake switch. So again, it's really nice and simple. I'm literally just taking my white with a blue wire. I'm going to provide it with 12 volts. And as I do, you hear the relay click. I'm just gonna try and see if you can see all in one go. All right, and you see stop light switch is now showing is on. If I pull it away, it goes off, put it on, it goes on. Okay, it is quite important to have that. This is a modern auto, it's not an auto from the 1950s. So when it has things like where you're pressing the brake or not, it does do things for you in terms of like helping with deceleration. So again, it's not for nothing. Um, please do connect it up. It is all protected inside, so just, just literally take that wire, tap it into your brake light switch if it's got the 12 volts there, or tap it into the wire that provides your brake lights. Um, again, very useful, please do connect that up. Okay, right, so that's your brake switch. So fuel pump, this is gonna be a nice, easy one. We are actually literally just gonna do an active test. And all we're gonna do is go into, now I did put a link up, or I should have put a link up for the fuel pump, okay? Now, that's gonna explain why it says fuel pump relay and fuel pump, if you can see that, okay? So I'm not gonna go into detail now, you can watch the video and it'll explain all of that information there. But fuel pump is what we wanna test. And all we're gonna do is turn it on. So one, two, three. Hear the relay click. You can hear the pump working there, hopefully. Fantastic, okay. So that's all good. So we know the ECU is controlling the fuel pump because I'm doing it through the OBD2 machine. I'm not touching any wires or anything here. So that is all fine. Right, so now we're gonna move into actually starting the engine up. So again, 
It's gonna be loud, it's got no exhaust on it, it's just the headers. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do a quick recap, very quickly, I'm gonna jump in, start it, we're gonna get testing. So, starter motor, simple, because it starts. ACIS, we're gonna go back over to this valve over here, make sure that closes. Drive-by wire, we're gonna make sure the engine revs on the pedal there, you can actually hear the throttle. Already. Uh, VVTR solenoids, we're gonna come back over to the machine, we're gonna activate both oil control valves, one at a time, each bank, and you're gonna hear the engine note change dramatically as I do that. Tack, we're gonna come back and make sure that the TACO signal is working. We're also gonna make sure that the um, oil light is off and also the alternator light is off. Remember, the check engine light's gonna remain on because we still got the codes for the solenoids which is not connected over there, all right? Then we're gonna go through the injectors and coils and just take them off one by one to show you that each cylinder is misfiring as I remove them. And then we're gonna come back, we're gonna switch off the engine and then we'll go back to the diagnostics and go uh, explanation into that as well. Okay, right, so, so nice and simple, black with a yellow tracer and we're gonna start, three, two, one. Okay, so start up works. Ignition back on again now. Right, okay, so that's all sorted out. So, all the ones while the engine's running are working exactly as I expect them to, so super happy with that. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go into the diagnostics. Now, to start off with, diagnostic machine, this is the best way to go. It's gonna get you all the live data. The ECU is equipped with OBD2, so it's a much better way of getting live data from the ECU and error codes. Unfortunately, with the 3UZ with European and a US ECUs, you cannot read the flash codes via bridging TE1, or TC in this case, obviously. Um, so that option is off the table, unfortunately. You do need to have a diagnostic machine. Uh, we have still included TC in the actual uh, OBD2 plug, and the reason for that is you can still bridge it and you can still get it to do the timing lock. So, you can see down here, you've got timing marks, 0, 5, 10, and 15 degrees. And if I go around the pulley here, let's see if I manage to get the pulley in the right place. Ah, there you go. So you can see they've actually marked it with white paint. So there's a timing mark. So you can still bridge um, T, TC and um, a ground. So in this case, it's gonna basically be number, 
this one over here, which is 13, and the one directly above it, which is number five. So you bridge those two together, you will lock the timing at 10 degrees, you can put your timing light on cylinder one or ignition coil one, and you should see 10 degrees of timing. Okay, obviously don't leave that bridge because then you have 10 degrees of timing the whole time, which is gonna make the car run like absolute dog. Okay, so just bear in mind, don't do that, but you can do that, but you can't get codes, unfortunately, okay. Now then, going over to this particular case over here, you can see the check engine light did stay on when it was running. Unfortunately, I don't don't have a gearbox to plug the solenoids into so just to show you over here we've got solenoid sh solenoid shift circuit one two three and four we've got slu slt and sln okay so that's all the seven codes that are there that's purely related just to the solenoid plug over there so you can see we haven't got any secondary lambda codes uh, we haven't got obviously a mobilizer code because that is now obviously gone as well uh, the ecu is remapped in terms of like it's got better throttle response um, it's got a little bit more power. The shift points have been changed slightly just to get back a little bit more sporty and so on. So that has all been carried on in the ECU as well as most importantly the secondary lambda sensors. So you get no code for that as well. All right. So that is all done. So again, we've gone through the test. I'm happy with everything. Obviously, we want to get this off to Duncan now so he can get his vehicle up and running. If you guys have any questions in relation to this, please let me know. Uh, as per usual, you can comment down below. We try and get to those as much as we can. You can also find us on Facebook at Phoenix Engine Management. You can message us there if you have any questions or queries you'd like to ask. Um, just a heads up, guys. Everything we do pretty much is quite... Um, some of the stuff is standardized. Some of it is completely custom. Uh, so what you do is when you do get in contact with us, what we will do is obviously ask you for a lot more information about exactly what it is so if you've seen my other videos like how many different types of three uz's there are the same applies for one uz the same applies for two jz the same applies for those there are loads of different types and there are differences between the different types so we do need to know quite a lot of information before we can do any type of quoting just a quick heads up for you guys so that you know what it is some of it's quite easy and standardized because a lot of you guys want it but some of it's off the beaten track we do have to do custom drawings and custom designs so we can get that all done and quoted for you so please bear that in mind when you are messaging us uh, give as much information as you can it helps us get uh, information to you as quickly as possible all right but again so if you have any questions comments suggestions please leave them down below anything you guys would like to see me test uh, please let me know um, just bearing in mind we are actually we do have the gearbox for this engine uh, we are in the process now of building proper stands that would then house the automatic gearbox when we do these with the autos we will actually have the gearbox to plug in and we will get that all done i don't have a time frame on that please don't hold me to that uh, you guys keep us incredibly busy so we will try to do that as quickly as we possibly can but Stick around, there are the photos of the complete harness uh, on the bench coming up at the end. And Duncan, stick around because there's the photos of what it looks like underneath the intake here. Um, all the two knock sensors are labeled, so you will actually know which one goes where. Um, so just remember, they're labeled as knock one and two. So this is this is cylinder one, and uh, bank one, the left-hand side. Bank two is the right-hand side. So cylinder one is on bank one and cylinder two is on bank two, okay? So when you come to the knock sensors, it says K and K1, K and K2. K and K1 is on this side, K and K2 is on that side over there, okay? All right, but thanks for watching, guys. We will see you again soon. And again, um, any questions, let us know. But we'll see you again soon, guys. Bye-bye.